Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you as we gather together for worship this morning. It is my prayer that the time that we spend together will be a blessing, that we will be aware of God's presence, that we would be challenged and equipped through His Word, and that we would experience His love as we worship Him together. I do want to remind you, as I did two weeks ago, that we are, uh, as a session uh, uh, of elders, thinking through what some form of online community might look like, as many uh, folk have been watching these services, some not even in Pretoria, but uh, in different parts of the country and in different parts of the world. And, and we're just wondering what an online community might look like. And uh, I asked for feedback. I got one or two emails back. But it would be fantastic if you have any thoughts or ideas of what has been helpful, what hasn't been helpful in the services so far. Any kind of feedback that you can offer us will be very helpful and mean a great deal. So please do consider giving me feedback about that. Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11 and the steps of faith. Today, our call to worship comes from the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, where the writer to the Hebrews says, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out. For us. Let's worship God together. Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, creator of mountain and ocean and river, of sunset and sunrise, of rainbow and cloud, we gather together in your name to worship and adore you. You are the God without beginning and the God without end. You are matchless and mighty, majestic and victorious. And Lord, we worship you as creatures who recognize that you have created with abundance and with beauty, that you are faithful even when we are not, that you are gracious even though we are broken, and we honor you as our King, as our Lord, as our Savior, and our God. As we come into your presence, Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you, against others, and even against ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for our pride our envy, for our laziness and our stubborn disobedience. Forgive us, Lord, for the number of times that we have heard your word but not put it into action. Forgive us when our hearts have been hard and callous. Thank you, gracious God, that you are slow to anger 
and abounding in love. That you sent your son Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that through his blood and through the sacrifice that he made on the cross, we stand forgiven. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for your amazing grace. And now, Lord, be with us in our time of worship. Be with us as we come before you and hear your word. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. morning boys and girls I know that by just looking at my t-shirt you know which team I belong to and that's Manchester United uh, and by just seeing the t-shirt you probably know how many seasons they lost or you know how many seasons they won or maybe they played against your team and they lost or they won so by just this t-shirt you know where I belong and as children of God we belong to God we are in God's team and there's a few things that we need to have to show that we are the children of God, to show that we belong to, a, 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 to God's team. And I'm going to read some of those things in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. 
and it says galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says but the holy spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control there is no law against these things. So as children of God, we need to show those um, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so people can know that we belong to God's team. Okay, boys and girls, let's pray. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you, God, that we belong to your team. And because we belong to your team, we know that we are cared for. You take care of us, you take care of our families, and you take care of everyone around us. And I pray, God, that as, as your children, we will show love to those around us. We will show the joy of God that's in our lives and we'll be patient, we'll be good, we'll be kind to those that are around us. Please help us, my God, in the ones that we struggle with. I pray, God, that you help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have a long but important scripture reading to look at today, and it's Paul writing to his protege, Timothy. Timothy was a young man that Paul was nurturing in the faith. He put him in charge of a congregation. And the reading that we're going to read is from Paul's second letter to Timothy. And we think that this is one of the last letters that Paul wrote before he was beheaded for his faith and that he died as a martyr. The letter is poignant and urgent. And in chapter 4, we hear Paul say to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept my faith. And there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. And so in this letter, we have Paul kind of giving his last instructions to Timothy, the last chance that he has to prepare Timothy for the rest of his ministry and to prepare Timothy for, for a life where Paul will no longer be present. And so Paul needs to say all the things that Timothy needs to hear. And in chapter 3, Paul talks about the brokenness of the last days. And to be honest, this is a very difficult passage because it talks about the brokenness of society. And, and Paul as he explores this brokenness of society, talks about even the brokenness that, that affects families and, 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 and society. He even talks in the middle of, of our scripture reading, in a very difficult section, about women who are taken advantage of by false teachers. And it really is what we would in modern days call a case of gender-based violence. Because these false teachers come in, they influence these women, they use their false teaching to, to trap these women, 
in difficult lifestyles. And as Paul talks about it, he compares them to Janus and Jambres, who, according to Jewish tradition, were the magicians that competed with Moses. When Moses was doing his signs in front of Pharaoh, these court magicians tried to match Moses' miracles. And so Paul recognizes the danger of false teachers and how misleading they can be. And we see the devastating impact that these kinds of false teachers had. And so that's the middle section of our reading. In the last part of the passage, Paul talks about the guidance that, that is available to live a life of faith. And he, he offers Timothy three important resources. The first resource is the example that Paul himself has set for Timothy. The second resource is Timothy's upbringing, that he had a godly upbringing and godly parents uh, or a godly mother and a godly grandmother, and that this heritage is of great benefit to Timothy. The third resource that Paul offers Timothy is God's word, that Timothy is able to rely on God's word as the guidance that he needs for life. And so our reading is this beautiful but challenging compilation of the brokenness of, of society and then in contrast the, the, the hope that we have of being able to live a life of faith in the midst of a broken society. So let's listen to God's word. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far, because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you have known those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of our hearts bring you praise and glory and honor, now and forevermore. Amen. Did the, script, the first part of the scripture reading depress you a little bit? I must say that in the last couple of weeks I've been frustrated because it feels to me like I've just been seeing people at their very worst. And if you go through the list in the first two verses, it feels to me like I can just go and tick off so many of, of the broken examples that we see. People who are lovers of money, check. 
people who are lovers of themselves, check. Boastful, check. Proud, check. Abusive, check. Disobedient to parents, check. Ungrateful, check. And so it goes. And I, I've struggled with just seeing so much brokenness going on around me. Whether it's in the news and, and uh, international, like the war in the Ukraine or our politics in, in local life. But even in my day-to-day -day dealings with people, it just seems that the ugly side is so present and so real at the moment. And, and at times when one feels despairing, one feels frustrated, one feels discouraged. And, and Paul picks up on that frustration. And, and as I spoke about earlier in the introduction, he's particularly upset about the abuse of false teachers who abuse women and, and how Paul struggles with what's going on all around him. And, and he says, these things will happen in the last days. And so many people ask the question, well, when are the last days? Is Paul talking about his time or a time in the future? And could it be that maybe now, and, and a lot of people have said to me, sure, if I look at this list in Timothy and I see all of that's going on right now, then we're in the last days right now. But what's interesting is that Paul says to Timothy, when he makes this list of all these uh, horrible things that, that people get up to and do, he says, steer clear of people like this, have nothing to do with them. In other words, these people weren't in the future. They were in Paul and Timothy's present. It was happening right now because the last days began when Jesus stepped into our world and the last days will end when Jesus returns again. And so throughout history, we will see this cycle of brokenness, of people who are far from God, society that falls far from God. And, and so just as they were there in Paul and Timothy's time, these kinds of people and this kind of brokenness are here in our time too. And the question is, well, how do we cope? How do we cope when we see this extent of, of brokenness and, and sadness all around us. When, when Paul can spend 10 verses talking about how society is broken and how people are abusive and, and how people are victimized and, and trapped and, and put into very difficult circumstances, how do we cope when it's like that? And from verses 10 to 17, Paul gives us coping advice. And as I said in the introduction, Paul gives three resources. The first is his example, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on that in a moment or two. But the second resource that Paul gives is Timothy's godly upbringing. Timothy had a mother and a grandmother who were people of faith, and they had, they had showed him the way, not only in words, but also in action. Notice how Paul says to Timothy, because you know those from whom you learned it. He says, keep walking in the way that was passed on to you, for you know those from whom you learned it. In other words, Paul is saying, you know that these people are genuine, that they, their actions match their words. Timothy had a heritage of faith. And, and I want to talk here about how important it is that we pass our faith on to our children and grandchildren, and that they see faith, not just hear faith, but see faith in you and me. The third resource that Paul gives to Timothy is he says, and you've known God's word, the scriptures. They breathed from God and they're useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God is fully equipped for every good work. And so we have these three resources, Paul's example, a godly heritage, and the scriptures. But I want to spend a bit of time 
with Paul's example because there are five characteristics of Paul's example that I really want to just spend a bit of time with. Paul says to Timothy, you know about my teaching and my way of life. And a little later on, he reminds Timothy about his sufferings in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra. Now, those are towns in, in Galatia, which were near where Timothy grew up. And what Paul is saying is, you watched me go through these struggles. You were an eyewitness of the persecution that I experienced. And, and we know from the book of Acts that Paul was even stoned in one of these cities. And, and that he experienced incredible hardship. And yet stayed true to the gospel, continued to preach and continue to serve God. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, you've seen me. Learn from my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. And I want to look at these five qualities that are part of Paul's example, and that you and I can learn from. So let's start with the first quality, and that is, the quality of purpose. That Paul knows that we are not here by accident, but that we have a purpose, that God has put us here to accomplish a purpose. Paul knew that his purpose was to preach to the Gentiles about the love of God. This gave meaning to his life. It meant that his life had value, that he was entrusted with the gospel. And in the same way, you and I, need to plug into our purpose. We are not here by accident. We are here and God has a purpose with our lives. Our talents, our gifts, our circumstances, our situations, our backgrounds, our heritage and our history is all a gift from God. And we have purpose. He has put us here, as Mordecai said to Esther, for such a time as this. And we have a part to play in God's kingdom, and in God's work. And so we need to connect to our purpose. But Paul goes on to say, not only did you see my purpose, but you saw my faith. You saw that I lived by faith. And as Paul writes to, uh, to the Corinthians, he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. I can't see everything that God has planned for me. But I believe that God is at work in me. And as I trust God, as I put my faith in God, He will open up the next steps for me. And we are called to live by faith. We are called to do what God has asked us to do, even when we can't see all the steps, even when we don't know what's coming. And we see this in the life of Paul, we see this in the life of the other disciples and apostles. We have to walk by faith. We have to trust in a God we can't see and in a future that we don't fully understand or know. We have to believe that God is at work in us and trust that He can do what we cannot even begin to grasp or predict or understand. The third quality that Paul wants Timothy to emulate is the quality of patience. And I love the Greek word that Paul uses because the word is makrothumia. Makrothumia. And you just it just sounds like patience, doesn't it? Macro, uh, and, and that uh, uh, preposition indicates um, uh, the same thing that it does in English, that you have to have lots of it. You need to have lots of patience. Lots of trust. Lots of, of, of saying, I, I don't know everything and, and, and I can get tired, but I need to be patient. I can't become irritated. I can't become despondent. I need to have macrothumia. As frustrating and as wearing as my circumstances may be, I need patience. I can't allow my circumstances to wear me down. I need to have 
macrothumia. The fourth quality that Paul talks about is the quality of love. Agape, the godlike love that, that keeps no record of wrongs, that, that is patient and kind. The love that, that emulates the love of Christ that he revealed to us when he died for us on the cross. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Paul lived a life of love, reaching out to Jew and Gentile alike, offering the grace and the goodness of God, serving faithfully, this all out of love, unconditional love, love that didn't care about your race or your culture or your gender or your status or your position. Love that forgave. Love that restored. Paul calls us to live lives of radical, godlike love. The fifth and final quality that Paul calls us to emulate, that we need to develop endurance, perseverance, uh, long-suffering. These are all words that, that various translations use to try and translate this word, endurance. That we need to develop the ability to keep going. And, and patience is an attitude, whereas endurance, in a sense, is, is kind of a skill, a fitness that, that, that we begin to obtain. That, that we practice this. In the gym, the only way that you can develop endurance is to, to push and to push and to push some more. When one wants to run long distances, there's only one way to do it, and that is to push and to push and to push some more. This is what Paul calls us to do. We need to develop that kind of hippomone, that ability to push and push and push some more. So let me conclude. The gospel, the message of Christ, means that we'll experience trouble. If we're going to be preachers of the gospel and people who live the gospel, if we're going to be living letters that, that people can read the gospel in our lives, we will experience trouble. We will experience persecution. We will experience a broken world. And the broken world around us will vex us and trouble us and, and we'll struggle with injustice and brokenness. We will struggle with the greed and, and the selfishness of society. And as I look back at my own heart over the last couple of weeks, I have struggled intensely with this. I've struggled with how hard people's hearts are and how cruel people are and how difficult People make one another's lives. It's grieved and vexed me. And what Paul has done for us is say to us, this happens. Society is broken. And we will experience these levels of selfishness and even abuse in our society. And we will see people being victimized. But when we encounter that, we have resources. We have the scriptures that we can rely on and go to. And they will equip us to live our lives in this world. Secondly, we have the godly upbringing that we've been gifted with. And, and many of us have the privilege of having had godly parents, godly upbringings. And we can offer that to our children and our grandchildren. But we also have Paul's example. Paul's example of a life that was lived well right to the end. And right at the end of his life, he can write to Timothy and he can say, you've seen me, you've watched me, you've seen that this is true of, of my life. And so, Live with purpose. 
Live with faith. Live with patience. Live in love. And develop endurance. And if you've been looking around yourself and the, and the world around you, if you've been looking around and getting discouraged, I want to say to you, hang in there, saints of God. Hold on, people of God. The world looks like a tough place. And this isn't the first time that the world has looked like a tough place, and it won't be the last time either. We will struggle with the brokenness of our world. But know this, we have purpose. We are not here by accident, and God has a plan for our lives. Secondly, learn to walk by faith. Learn to believe that God is at work and that He is able to do more than you can think or imagine. And He is able to unleash power and goodness and love in you if you'll just trust in Him. So walk by faith. Thirdly, be patient. Macrothumia. Be patient. Recognize that, that in spite of the frustrations, we are called to walk to the beat of a different drum. And we will have to be patient, macro patient sometimes, as the world vexes us and troubles us. We need to choose not to be derailed and, and destabilized and, and knocked off course. We have to be patient. In the fourth point, we need to live lives of radical love. To diffuse the brokenness with love. To heal the heartache with love. To dilute the anger and aggression with love. To model the love of Christ to a broken world. And in the final instance, we will need to have hyper-endurance. We will need to push and push and push some more. That we get stronger and stronger and our ability to endure improves and grows. More than ever, our world needs to see the light of Christ. There is no space for wimpy Christians who will back down and back out and run away from the fight. We need to know our purpose. We need to walk by faith. We need to be patient and then love radically and endure pushing and pushing and pushing. May God give us grace and courage to do just that. Amen.
While we can't take up a physical offering, we can still respond to God's word and goodness by offering ourselves. Let us pray. Father God, you take care of our every need. We do not have to worry about tomorrow. You have made us each with our own unique set of talents and gifts, and we are grateful. We joyfully offer ourselves up to you, our time, our resources, and our talents, that you might be glorified. Amen. Let's pray. God, our Father, we have heard your word to us today, and we thank you that you came into our world because of the brokenness and the heartache. And you came in love and laid down your life for us to heal us and restore us. And then you sent your spirit into us that we might be part of your grace being extended to the world. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in the footsteps of Christ and in the footsteps of Paul, to live lives of purpose and faith and patience and love and endurance. Give us courage and strength, Father God, to serve you and live for you and make a difference in your name. And we thank you, Father, for the blessings that you pour out in our lives, our privileges and and, and the blessings of our loved ones. Thank you for the opportunities that we have. But we would pray, Lord, for those that we know are going through difficult times. We would pray for that brokenness that we see in the world. And we pray that you would raise up your sons and daughters to make a difference. We lift to you our loved ones who are struggling with health, with their circumstances, with their relationships. And we pray for ourselves. Be with us in our temptations. Keep us strong, Lord. Help us to serve you with purpose and faith and patience and love and endurance. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. been a great privilege to be with you this morning and I do pray that the service has been an inspiration and a blessing to you. 
it's been a challenging message to prepare and preach. I've felt three fingers pointing back at me. Um, I've needed to overcome the challenges that I've been feeling and the negativity that that so easily can swallow us. But I'm I'm encouraged. I'm hopeful. We're called to live with purpose and faith, with patience and love, enduring and pressing on. And I pray that you will experience the same. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us, now and forevermore. And here are the birthdays for Emmanuel and Grace. On Sunday the 14th, Kanzanet, Greg, Craig and Loney. On Tuesday the 16th, Catherine and Martin. On Wednesday the 17th, Thomas who turns 18. On Thursday the 18th, Theo, Tadiwa who turns 17, Sandra, John, Javak, Anne and Nikki. On Friday the 19th, Emilia, Dorothy, Billy Jean and Malangeti. And on Saturday the 20th, Dot. There are no anniversaries for this week. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you that we can remember these folks this week as they celebrate their birthdays. We thank you, Lord, for bringing them through another year. We pray, Lord, that you would just surround them with their loved ones um, on their birthdays and that they would have a beautiful day. We pray that you watch over them in the year ahead um, and walk with them. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.